Hey, folks. Jeffrey Owens here, actor, musician, sometime writer, teacher, director. Um, many of you might recognize me from The Cosby Show and from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and more recently from um, Power and Ghost and also The Good Fight. Um, thanks for joining and listening um, to this three-part series about the films of Sidney Poitier, who, as you know, passed away recently at the age of 94. Um, I am not a film historian. I'm not any kind of historian. I'm not, a, I'm not a critic. I'm not a film critic. I'm an actor and someone who loves movies and theater and someone who loved, adored Sidney Poitier as, as an actor. Um, when he passed away recently, of course, I'd, I'd seen a number of his films over the years, but when he passed away, I did a little research, um, deciding that I, in honor of him, watch his films. And I discovered how many films of his he did uh, he did that I wasn't even aware of. I, I had the general impression he had done a lot of films, but there's so many films that I had never even heard of, let alone seen. So it was quite a revelation. It's just a, a, an exciting discovery. And so recently, I've actually watched, uh, over the last week or so since his passing, um, I've watched a number of films, some of which I'd seen before and, and many of which I hadn't. Um, so and when I started watching the films, I had an idea just to kind of do a little series uh, talking about, you know, some, just some of my personal impressions of, about his, his wonderful films. Give me one second. I'm going to just click on this light here. So I have a little more light. Good. Hopefully that won't fall over onto me. Uh, so yeah. So um, uh, just a little bit about my background with Sidney Poitier. He was, he was my first idol as an actor, my first inspiration as an actor, um, as I was deciding to, he's one of the reasons I decided to be an actor. Um, he was my favorite actor. He's still one of my favorite actors. Um, and he meant so much to me growing up. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to actually meet him once, very briefly. An interesting story. Uh, my admiration of him was only enhanced by reading his first autobiography, a wonderful book called This Life, uh, which many people may not be aware of. If you have a chance to get a hold of it and read, a, read it, it's amazing. Uh, many people know his second book, The Measure of a Man, but his first autobiography, This Life, is just wonderful. I, I read that book a couple of times at least. The second time I read it, the, on the day that I finished reading it, the very day I finished reading it, I walked into a Barnes & Noble store in Manhattan and saw for the first time his second book, The Measure of a Man. And I thought that was such an extraordinary coincidence that on the day that I finished this life, I discover I hadn't heard anything about it. I discovered that he had a second book out. I bought it that day. But I also bought it again when I found out that he was going to have a book signing of The Measure of a Man in Manhattan. This was back in, I think, 2000. And I went to that bookstore, bought another copy, got online. And long story short, I did meet him. I met Mr. Poitier as he signed my book. I made sure to introduce myself, made sure that he knew who I was, that I was part of the Cosby cast. Of course, if you know, in case you don't know, he had a very close relationship with Bill Cosby and collaborated with Bill on a number of films. So uh, it meant something to him that I was uh, on the show. Uh, and, and he was very gracious as he signed the book. I gave him a package uh, as I, as I, as he signed and I implored him to open it at his leisure. It was a, a note, a long note of admiration for him and also an invitation, um, from my wife and, and me for him to join us, uh, for dinner while he was in town. I didn't really expect that that would happen, but I just threw it out there anyway. I didn't expect that he would call. Uh, don't you know about a week and a half or two weeks later, I was doing something in my apartment in Manhattan and the phone rang. I was, remember I was busy. I answered the phone. Yeah. 
<laughs> Hello? I'm like, yeah. Hello, is this Jeffrey Owens? I'm like, yeah. Yes, this is Jeffrey. What? Who is this? You know, get to the point. I'm busy. This is Sidney Poitier. Oh, I, I've never switched moods so quickly. I remember just sitting down on the bed. <laughs> I'm like, I was like, hello. Hello, Mr. Poitier. How are you, Jeffrey? Thank you for your lovely invitation. I'm sorry that I won't be able to come to dinner, but I so appreciate your your invitation. And we chatted. I don't remember what else we said. We chatted for a few minutes, said goodbye. Said goodbye, always expecting that someday I would meet him. Never meet him again. Never happened. But I just thought that was extraordinary that he took the time uh, to call. And it's one of my most treasured moments ever in my life. Um, unfortunately, I never saw him again. Um, my wife and I, uh, at a Tyler Perry ev event uh, three or four years ago, were sitting at a table with his wife and one of his daughters. And I asked them if it was possible, if I was in LA, because I was in LA pretty frequently, if I could uh, visit him. And their answer was very, not, not rude, but very final. And, and made it clear that no, he was not seeing anyone except close friends and family. And I've never felt so disappointed in my life as when I got that definitive no to that. I understood it completely, didn't resent it at all. But I was so, I was kind of crushed in a way that um, uh, that the opportunity to see him again would probably never come about. And of course, he passed away recently. Um, but what a great, what a great man. Um, what, a, what a great actor, what a great movie star. Um, and I thought, you know, as I was watching these films that I would just... Um, just share my thoughts about them in, in kind of in three parts. The, the first part being from the beginning of his film career in 1950 through 1957. And there's a lot of stuff there. And then the next phase from 1958 through uh, the mid to late 60s. Um, and, then, and then on from there. Um, uh, as I said, a lot of films that I had never even uh, heard of and some that I had heard of. His first film... Um, was No Way Out, uh, 1950. Uh, so when you think of it, I, by the time he won his Academy Award in 1963, he had been in the film in film for 13 years. You know, by the time he had that string of hit films in 1967, uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, In the Heat of the Night, and To Serve with Love, he was a 17-year film veteran. Um, so anyway, it's just it, it's just extraordinary to me how much he did in in that time. No Way Out, nineteen fifty, directed by the great film director Joseph L. Mankiewicz, um, a decent film, a bit dated, um, black and white, um, co-starring Richard Widmark, um, with whom he's going to star in, in a couple of other films later, uh, the the Long Ships and um, the Bedford Incident in the nineteen sixties. He'll He'll reunite with Richard Widmark um, again later on. It's it's um, Poitier's first film role, and it's a lead. I mean, he's he's one of the two leads. Um, after some years in the theater, he jumps right into carrying a film, not a supporting part, not you know background. You know, he he's the lead of his first film. Uh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, Co-stars Richard Widmark, as I said. Um, Poitier plays a doctor who, despite being black, is hired because he is the best. Um, his employer is supposedly colorblind, um, although his patient, Richard Widmark, his racist patient is not colorblind at all. Uh, this theme of colorblindness, colorblindedness, of Poitier not just being the best black person at something, but simply being the best person is central to his life. It's central to his casting, his choices of roles, uh, his place in American society. It's an ongoing theme. 
Um, I couldn't find one of his next films, 1951's or 1952's Cry the Beloved Country, uh, which I saw many years ago, but I haven't seen recently, in which he shares top billing with uh, another notable black actor, Canada Lee. It was actually Canada, Lee, Canada Lee's uh, last film. Um, I look forward to finding that film, probably ordering it on DVD and watching it. Uh, I also couldn't find another early movie of his from 1954, Go Man Go, which is about the Harlem Globetrotters. I'm intrigued. I don't know if he actually plays one of the Globetrotters or someone um, auxiliary to the team, but that's an interesting idea. Uh, in this film, he shares the screen with the great uh, Ruby D, an actress with whom he will have a long artistic uh, relationship in film, as you'll see. Um, third film I watched, and what seems to be the third film in, in his filmography, Red Ball Express. Here's a film that I'd never heard of before, and I don't think most people have ever even heard of. 1952, co-starring the movie star Jeff Chandler. Um, now, after playing leads in his first films, Poitier takes a back seat in this one, interestingly. Uh, I guess he came to the conclusion early on, I'm not going to get the lead in every in every uh, uh, movie. If I want to work as an actor in Hollywood, I'm not going to, it's better that I don't hold out for the lead in every film. Anyway, he takes a, a supporting role in this. There are a number of black actors in this film. Poitier is definitely the only one whose character is significant. Um, even so, um, he is not, his character is not particularly germane to the main plot. Um, Poitier's acting in these early films is not particularly exceptional, although it is certainly solid. There's nothing weak or wrong about it, just it's not the acting that he does later in his career, and wouldn't be surprised to know that um, as he's learning how to act, as well as learning how to act in film. What is evident and obvious from these first films, though, is how confident and how in command, in control he is, both as a performer, as a character, and as, as a person. What shines through, even this early in his career, is that he is a special, perhaps even unique, human being. This, more than anything, defines his presence on screen. So it's this combination of, yes, the good job he does as an actor, the fact that he's handsome and charismatic, and then there's, there's this quality that I'm sure had not been seen in any actor of color in film before him um, that just commanded a kind of awe and respect uh, that went beyond the confines of just the film just reached into his life and the life of the country. It's interesting. After Red Ball Express, 1955, um, Blackboard, Blackboard Jungle. Um, there may have been a film or two between them. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but the next significant film, Blackboard Jungle, which I'd seen before, watched it again recently, co-starring, uh, starring Glenn Ford, uh, Richard Kiley, Kiley and Vic Morrow. Um, as well as a very young uh, Paul Mazursky, the future film director, and Jamie Farr, who became best known as Klinger on the TV series MASH. Uh, here, interestingly, working under his Lebanese birth name, his last name Far Farah, and his first name, not Jamie, but some version of that. Um, interesting. Um, Poitier is not the star of this film, but he is heavily featured. Uh, playing a high school teenager, at least, by the way, 10 years younger than his actual age. He was about 28 when he did the film. He's playing a 17 or 18-year-old. He is striking in his appearance. He brings new meaning to the phrase tall, dark, and handsome. Uh, his acting in this film is noticeably more relaxed and stronger than his work in No Way Out, although uh, the writing and direction might account for some of that difference. The both of those things being, I think, really superior to that of uh, either um, uh, No Way Out or Red Ball Express. Um, next film I want to talk about is actually a television film uh, called A Man is Ten Feet Tall. Now, I never heard of this project uh, before. This is from 1955. A Man is Ten Feet Tall was a Philco 
television playhouse production, one of the live television productions that they used to do where they actually uh, film things live. So for the actors, it was like theater. They had to know their, their shit, know their lines and blocking, and there was no room for messing up, and then it was being filmed and broadcast. Um, it was co-starring uh, Martin Balsam, who was um, extremely active at that time as an actor. He was in On the Waterfront and uh, continued to be very active in film for the next 20, 25 years. Um, Poitier's role in this live television film is a talky one. Uh, his character is very talkative, very gar garrulous, uh, with much more dialogue than in his, pres in his previous films. Um, his character's death in this story is is shocking. Uh, characters, uh, Poitier's character is killed by um, the character played by um, Martin Balsam. Uh, once again, as in No Way Out and Blackboard Jungle, race is a key issue thematically in the film. Once again, Poitier is surrounded by a predominantly white context society cast. And as the only black or only significant black, he fights for the cause of racial equality. Once again, Poitier's character, like Poitier himself, is fighting to be accepted for who and what he is as a person. Now, the next thing I have here, the next thing I watched, and I think happens chronologically, is that that television film, A Man is Ten Feet Tall, becomes a, a, a film called Edge of the City, 1957. Two years after the television film, uh, some producer liked A Man is Ten Feet Tall so much, they bought it and made it into a movie. Uh, directed by Martin Ritt, a very well-known uh, film director, and co-starring John Cassavetes, Jack Warden, who took over the Martin Balsam role, and Ruby D, who plays Poitier's wife. Again, they're working together. Uh, Poitier is the only cast that is kept for the remake. Everyone else in the original is replaced. Now, why didn't they replace Poitier? Because they couldn't. He was, he was literally irreplaceable. There wasn't anyone else like him available. He was the black star actor. He had no competition. I'm not saying there weren't many other black actors. There was no one else in that lead actor category who could command the confidence of directors, producers, casting people, etc., and audiences as 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 Poitier could. He was un literally unique at that time. There were many other fine black actors at the time, including Ossie Davis, uh, Ivan Dixon, Woody Strode, Brock Peters, many others. But none of them had the quality that Poitier had. That quality, as I said before, was that of a person who didn't define or confine himself according to color. Poitier certainly had skills as an actor, as well as looks and charisma. But it was this, I'm my own man, I'm one in a million, I'm not limited by how you see me, attitude and quality that defined his presence, that made him stand out from his black peers. I think the fact that he came from the Bahamas had a lot to do with it. You know, uh, everyone was black where he grew up. So no one was black. He expressed this in his book, his books. It, he, he didn't consider himself black. No one was black. Everyone was black. What did it mean to be black? He was just Sidney Poitier. That was that part of his background, that that insight, that that mindset had a lot to do with his life, how he, how he chose to do things, what he chose not to do, and how he came across on screen and in life. Um, Edge of the City, as a film, is noticeably superior to A Man is Ten Feet Tall, as a film. It's a good, it's a good solid film. Although um, Poitier's performance in both are very similar, actually. Poitier's performance doesn't particularly grow in the film from what he does in the um, in the TV in the TV show, uh, here once again he gets to act with Ruby D this time as her husband. The next, and we move into 1957, which is a very a very busy year. Uh, I guess 1956, 1957, very busy year for Poitier. He does uh, four four films, including Edge of the City. Um, the next film, uh, one of the films he does in 1957, is called The Mark of the Hawk, co-starring Eartha Kitt. 
um, The Great Eartha Kitt. I don't know why, but the copy of this film that I watched was very poor. Uh, sometimes I couldn't distinguish figures because of the lighting and uh, because or because of the film quality. Someone should, should definitely restore this film. Um, the film also has a very dated feel to it. The dialogue and the acting often sounds and, and uh, sound and feel stilted. Uh, Poitier transcends these limitations, but he doesn't do so by much. Even, even the vibrant Eartha Kitt, uh, here playing Poitier's wife uh, in one of her first two film roles, uh, even she seems dragged down by the film's kind of dated and dreary tone. If you see the film, I think you you might agree. It's definitely worth seeing because of its story and, and the nobility of uh, Poitier's character, but not a good film um, in film in filmic terms. Um, as I said, uh, the, these 56, 57, very busy years for Poitier. Edge of the City, Mark of the Hawk, uh, other two films, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, Band of Angels and Something of Value, uh, were all released in 1957, four films of his. Coincidentally, make of this what you will, they all have the word of in their titles. Edge of the City, The Mark of the Hawk, Band of Angels, and Something of Value. Interesting. I don't know what that means. Make of it what you will. Band of Angels. Now, this, this starred Clark Gable and Yvonne DiCarlo, directed by the great Hollywood director Raoul Walsh. Now, as bad as the production qualities were for The Mark of the Hawk, that's how good they are for Band of Angels. With a screenplay based on a novel by Robert Penn Warren and a production directed by Raoul Walsh and starring Clark Gable and Yvonne DiCarlo, it's no surprise that Hollywood did its best with this project. It's a very good, well-made, entertaining film. Um, Poitier is not the lead, but he has a strong and significant supporting role as Ra Ru, Clark Gable's steward. I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, here, as in other films, the character Poitier plays resists confinement, limitations, and stereotypes. His character, as is made clear in the film, is mentally and temperamentally equipped to take over Gable, Gable's uh, entire estate. At one point, Poitier's character, Raru, slaps Yvonne DiCarlo's character, a white woman, across the face, knocking her to the ground. And even though the film has established that the woman is a, a negress, uh, one who has passed for white all her life, the action of Poitier's hitting her must have been shocking, absolutely shocking to a 1957 audience. A very, very bold thing for that story, that film, that production to do. I also want to mention um, Poitier's costume in uh, Band of Angels. He's dressed beautifully, impeccably. And I wonder, I just can't help but wonder if he had something to say about it. <laughs> wonder if they came to him with another costume and he said, no, I think I want something better looking because, man, his costume is beautiful. It reminds me of, we'll talk about this in, another, in the next segment, in his costumes in... The, the Western Duel at Diablo from 1966. Um, his costumes are just off the, chart, off the charts gorgeous. Um, just just gorgeous. He, he's just absolutely cut such an amazingly stylish, charismatic figure. Um, the, last, the last film I want to talk about, the la and the last film from 1957, is Something of Value, uh, co-starring Rock Hudson, the great English actor Wendy Hiller, and William Marshall. Uh, by the way, William Marshall will, 15 years later, uh, appear in films as Blackula. But William Marshall has a supporting uh, role in this film. This film was directed by Richard Brooks, who also directed Blackboard Jungle, also wrote Blackboard Jungle. One of the supporting actors is William Marshall, the lady played Blackula, as I said. Um, Poitier gives a very emotional and strong performance as Kimani, a Kenyan who rises to leadership in an African uprising against British colonialism. As in No Way Out, he is not the lead, but he is a lead, playing a role central to the heart of the story. 
This, I think, is Poitier's fullest and finest film performance so far. Uh, his performance in Blackboard Jungle is also very fine, but this stretches him further. This role allows him to show significantly greater emotional range and mastery of character, mastery of his craft in general, and he rises admirably to the occasion. Highly significant, by the way. A white man, a character in this movie, slaps Poitier's character across the face. Poitier does not slap him back right away. Of course, immediately one shoots forward in time to 1967 to the famous slap back in the heat in, in the heat of the night. Later in the film, later in Something of Value, Poitier does slap that white man back. Interesting. Interesting. A trend here. And I have to wonder, I just have to wonder, was that slap back in Something of Value originally in the screenplay? Or did Poitier have something to do with its being in there? How much, even this early in his career, did he have a say, at least some say, in the development and depiction of his characters. I ask because I know that the slap in In the Heat of the Night was something he insisted on. He also refused to do numerous roles because the characters he was offered didn't have sufficient dignity, etc. And I'm just wondering, I'm, again, I'm no film historian and I have to go back into his autobiographies to kind of check some of this stuff, how much he had say in what he would and wouldn't do in these films. Um, I have a hunch that he had more to do, more to say about it, than one would think a relatively newcomer to Hollywood might, might, might have to say. Remember, he was in a unique position in Hollywood and in, in society. He was the man for these leading or semi-leading or highly uh, uh, strongly supportive roles. As I said before, there were other black actors, very fine actors, but none in this category of lead actor. Um, he was alone. Um, and I think because of that, he had a certain amount of cachet, a certain amount of say, a certain amount of leverage to do and not do what he wanted. Um, what a what a what a powerful thing. And I think I have a feeling that he he used that power and he used it well. He used it to his own advantage, the advantage of his own image, but the advantage of the collective image of black Americans. Um that's all for this time. Thanks, folks, for listening. Uh part two to come in the next uh, week or two, uh covering the years roughly 1958 through 1967 uh, or 68. Uh hope you'll Tune in and and uh, and join me for that. Um, take care. Be well. Bye bye.